Solar panels, smart lighting, and prop tech led property management systems are all cool, but if people find it hard to get into or use your building, what's the point? I'm Robert McLean, and in, and in this edition of the Prime Pod, I'm speaking with two guests about a new initiative about the most basic of building functions, accessibility, and about how many landlords and developers are unwittingly making life harder for their tenants. With me in the studio today is Taufik Sabangi of Colliers International, and I'm speaking online at the same time with Tomasz Meri, a co-founder of Access for You. Tomasz, maybe we could start with you because you, uh, you've actually been uh, involved in getting this, uh, getting this company going. How big a problem uh, is accessibility uh, these days, especially in Central Europe? I thought all the new buildings have wheelchairs, uh, are wheelchair accessible. Thank you. Hi, Robert. Hi. Let me start at that point that uh, probably it's an in- interesting statistic for, for all of us, for the audience, that uh, basically 15, 16% of all of each society is disabled people. So they are suffering uh, different kinds of barriers. Lim- they are living with limitations in terms of uh, moving or hearing visual impairments, cognitive problems. And um, and they don't see them. What is the problem? Why we don't see them among us in our everyday life? So they are underrepresented for sure. It's, uh, one reason is that uh, part of these uh, limitations are, are invisible. So like uh, someone with autism or a deaf person, is uh, you, you cannot recognize it. But major problem is that our built environment is not inclusive at all. That's the main reason. Inclus- inclusion means that uh, they can enter and they can ha- they can have an access to to the services of the of the buildings. So this is a big problem, and this is a global problem for them. Uh, and besides of uh, of that major lack that the buildings are not fully accessible for them, that there is no information about it. So the, for these people to be in a position to plan their life in advance based on real and true data is significant. It is far easier for them that the, if they know that wherever they go they can enter and they have an access uh, to the main services. And actually our, our answer is to solve this problem. We cannot save the world uh, rebuilding the, the whole, uh, all the buildings, the built environment, but to deliver true and detailed data about the accessibility of these buildings, this is feasible. This is our mission, what we are doing. Great. Thanks a lot for that. Maybe just so that people can understand, I think everybody gets the idea of wheel, wheelchair accessibility. Can you give a couple of examples of other types of, as you say, invisible handicaps or invisible issues that people wouldn't normally know about and what building owners or developers can do uh, to mitigate the problem. Yeah, for, so uh, actually, as a lake, we always think that accessibility is about uh, wheelchair users, but this is not the fact. Actually, they are only one stakeholder group of those eight who we are delivering the information. For example, with visual impairments. You are not blind, but you don't see correctly. I'm an age of 55, but a um, few weeks ago, I was running through a, a glass door uh, because I was busy and I had that time my glasses on um, with bad visual capacity, let's say, and I didn't recognize that there is a glass door in front of me. And actually with a very simple signage, or let's say it's a vignette or something, which a few uh, euro, let's say, the landlord could have made it for me, visible, and I wouldn't suffer a few days headache after the the knockout of the door. So this, this is, let's say, an example which is really we don't think of it. It's very simple. Is is that an example of something where even someone who is has very good sight, even someone like you or me, could run into it, could make that kind of that kind of a, a mistake? But that's the that's the type of thing that visually impaired people probably run into on a daily basis. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that, yes, it is like that. So actually what we see that for them is, let's say, is a, is a have to have. For us, is a nice to have. What does it mean? That if landlords are, are making a more uh, inclusive uh, environment in their buildings, which is a core need for these people with limitations, but it makes the whole building more convenient for, ev- for everyone. So basically the, the reached uh, crowd with these services is much wider than the people with limitation based on statistics. You understand what I mean? That uh, for them it's a need. For us it's a, it's a better life or it's a better environment. Okay, thanks a lot. 
topic, let's bring you into this. Why have you decided to get involved in this so much? What is it that speaks to you about it? Is there something? Is this something that you think has been ignored, even if it's unwittingly by by building owners and developers? Okay, first of all, so I want to say hi to everybody and to to the podcast listeners, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, well, I think that's a very um, critical, important question, and there is no one straight, simple, short answer to it. I think there there is a few aspects to it. First of all, uh, I think with time we are all evolving. Uh, the business environment, the business needs are changing. Uh, we need to become more flexible. We need to be more. Uh, uh, more holistic in, in our approach in general uh, because I think health and uh, and uh, having a balance between our work life and, 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 and social life even within within the office uh, or business uh, encounters is very important and critical uh, and I would not say it's only about the landlords or the owners I think it's a responsibility which is shared equally between the landlords owners but the tenants and occupiers uh, equally uh, it is important from two aspects one is uh, uh, it is the right thing to do on a on a humane level uh, it is important to be able to integrate uh, all all uh categories of 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 people with the differences they have uh including uh, the special needs some of 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 the citizens and people might have uh it's not that it has been ignored before i think there always existed certain norms which might vary from country to country legislation to legislation but and some of them have it uh, better said than others but i think in many in many aspects the practicality of it and 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 reflecting the real life encounters experiences into what is a norm is not always exactly matched uh, which means uh, and i give again a very very simple uh, example uh, <clears throat> most people and we mentioned that most people when they think of disability or people with special needs they instantly would probably think of a person in a wheelchair and we have just mentioned and heard it is the different types of of uh, of uh, inabilities which uh, we need to think of but uh, taking that example of a person in a wheelchair uh, most of the modern office buildings when they have their parking places they have dedicated or in the shopping centers and and retail parks they have dedicated uh, parking lots for uh, people with with wheelchairs Nevertheless, uh, where they are located is not always the most uh, naturally common, rational place where to locate them because they still have certain uh, obstacles uh, or uh, encounters they need to go through to reach the destination they, they need to, to reach. Uh, and this is a practicality thing which I think people, landlords, architects need to think of. Um, so uh, it is to be able to integrate people with special needs into the the lifestyle or the life, uh, the business life uh, of the of the companies, corporations. And the other thing is, and looking at it from uh, from the opposite side, uh, we all know that the demogra demogra demographics uh, across Europe and the world, Central Europe. Uh, we all sort of uh, meet the challenges of finding enough people to employ uh, people who could be good uh, at what they do uh, and uh, the category of the people with special needs there is there is a certain percentage of people who could be a very valuable input into the working force of every society of every country which are being somehow left out just because uh, the the facilities and the accessibility and the practical use of having them being part of an office makes it quite challenging for them to be to feel to feel comfortable about going to a place uh, and feeling fully integrated so if we improve that aspect that will open another window for the employment market to be able to start taking people on board who have been left out and are very valuable and can add a lot of value to all types of businesses. I think that's something that we're seeing more and more in society in general is this idea of how being inclusive as a company 
actually has great benefits for the entire company it, on various levels. Even, uh, uh, there's a new generation coming coming uh, coming into the workforce that I think demands those types of things. But I think also you tend to end up uh, being uh, more aware of the issues of your entire team. Well, uh, indeed, and and uh, uh, definitely, uh, it's good to see that societies and cultures and um, open-mindedness is changing, is improving. People are becoming far more toler tolerant in, in many aspects. Uh, others are not. Of course, there's always a counter-force, counter sure. this dynamics. But overall, definitely, yes. And as I said, uh, uh, the, I would say the the angle is widening between the the range and scope of w what you have as part of your ordinary day. So in terms of uh, age, uh, now the mix between much younger and much older people, and they still uh, work in the same office and do things. The the genders, the uh, nationalities, the languages spoken. We are becoming more. Um, multinational who are becoming more global actually in each of the different countries and places. When it comes to uh, companies, when you speak with them, how open are developers or landlords uh, t to these ideas of, of taking the idea of accessibility more seriously? Is it, is it something where you're saying you better do this or you're going to have problems or are, do they welcome this sort of an initiative from what you found? Well, my experience is actually mo most of our clients and most of the of the developers and investors are actually very supportive of that, uh, and they have been always sort of having it uh, as part of what they want to achieve. I think the 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 missing uh, the missing brick brick or the the bridge which was not that uh, available was having some uh, some specialized advisory firms telling exactly what are the things which need to be fine-tuned mm -hmm. it's not that they are non-existent but they may be at a very basic level maybe there are certain things which can be differently added and improved and people are just not simply aware of it not that they don't want to they just don't think of it or they uh, sometimes uh, you just miss certain very maybe straightforward easy things you, you simply miss them and the initiative and, uh, and, and and thanks to this also cooperation with uh, companies like Access for You, uh, because they specialize in it, they know exactly what it takes to improve what is missing or add or change. Uh, so it's another just way of consulting and helping, giving advice how you can improve your existing building or space uh, to allow a, a wider range of different people to be able to easily uh, commute and get and access your property so it's about mobility at the end right, of it right. yeah. Tomas, uh, on a practical level how does this work uh, a company calls you up said we'd like some we'd like to be advised on this what is the process how long does it take uh and like uh, what are the how quickly can can steps be made all right uh, but, uh, Robert, let me reflect first, just very briefly on what uh, Tafik told to us, that uh, we on our side, we have also um, a very positive uh, feedback from the companies. Um, really, the attitude is, is, is there. I mean, um, um, the, the landlords, the company owners, they understand that this is, um, on one side, this is um, a moral obligation for them. Um, on the other side, this is also a, a business potential for for a lot of companies. Either you are selling something, so you may uh, approach uh, another 15-16% of consumers, or as employer, um, um, also new doors are opening for you. So they are very positive. What was the, the luck here, the major problem, that there is no common language. They never understood that if I want to be inclusive, what does it mean? What should I deliver? What are the requirements? So basically, with our help, with our methodology, how we have them, and and now I can answer your question. That basically, access for you is a European uh, certification mark. Uh, we are giving a license to the uh, to the building that um, for which uh, stakeholders groups deliver the hard criteria. That means that uh, our approach is based on usability, not on different laws and and uh, codes. 
because the, as, as Tafik mentioned, the codes are similar but a bit different. And if you want to deliver a uniform, standardized um, um, solution uh, based on a mobile application, the requirements or the or the how to say the, the base rules must be the same. Otherwise, there is a must. So wherever they are traveling or users, they have to use the same system and and the same requirement. Um, in Europe, everything is based on the mainly on the ISO. There is a, uh, an ISO for um, for for uh, accessibility, and the local building codes are mainly reflecting on that. So there is a. a let's say, a, a, a strong common base for that. But um, we are also uh, building on, on it very much. But uh, our approach is a usability approach. Uh, what does it mean? It, uh, it uh, doesn't require so much from the landlords and it delivers um, enough for the user. So this is a kind of compromise. Um, and uh, based on these approaches, everything is much smooth and much friendly. And it's not uh, that kind of um, feeling that... Uh, um, a crowd is coming, shouting and requiring uh, what is their right. And so um, this is a kind of win-win situation. And uh, what is the solution? That in order to be entitled to use this certification, um, the time accessible for different kinds of groups, uh, an audit is required. Uh, we have a special software. We are collecting data. We uh, have something like 1,000 different questions about the buildings, uh, technical details that uh, what are relevant for the users. We are collecting all this data uh, with photos, with measurements, yes, no answers. So we are collecting every data, we are evaluating it. And based on that, we are issuing an, an audit report. The whole story takes um, in the largest building one day on-site work and plus uh, paperwork at home. So the whole procedure it depends only on the um, on the speed of the client, let's say, and our capacity in terms of audit. But uh, within two months, you can have a full and complete report, which is a mirror uh, to the building owners or the operator and also the tenant. We not only have access for your building as a product, which is a different kind of uh, real estate segment, public area where everyone can enter. But as mentioned, Tefik, the tenants are also responsible for their areas. This is the, the so-called access for you workplace, which is uh, not, uh, the principal is not uh, the building owner, but the user, the tenant. So it is, the entities are different. And, and, and for that reason, the, the product is a bit, is a bit different. Uh, so basically, once we are ready with the evaluation of our, um, um, our um, audit, um, the audit report contains um, the actual level of accessibility of the of the current uh, of the particular place. We also uh, include a chapter for uh, improvement suggestions, which is very important that they understand that um, how far I am and what have, shall I do in order to be more inclusive. And frankly, saying based on our experience, uh, a lot of these improvements are very very easy things. Um, um, a few hundred euro devices can help, for example. Uh, for people with uh, bad hearing, for example, or the signage, what I mentioned, or or um, uh, or the pictograph in in the buildings for the orientation that also helps uh, for one stakeholder group. So th these are really um, easy things. So it is not a huge investment for the landlord. The problem was that um, everyone has a basic fear uh, based on non understanding. So. Um, and the other side was that until now, um, ex I'm accessible was based on a, on a self-reporting system, but linked to nothing actually, linked to, to an everyday understanding what does it mean, and, um, but it was not accurate. So basically through this methodology, what we set up here, uh, we created a kind of common language between the users and the, and the building owners. And this was probably one of the major Lucky in this uh, whole story that uh, to create um, a common understanding actually. So the whole procedure is really uh, quick and uh, and valuable on the end uh, what we deliver. Okay. Do you have to go and make site visits uh, to to s confirm uh, uh, the the questionnaires you get, or h how does that work? Yeah, this is very important that uh, we say that uh, for the users, the detailed and the trustable information is um, is 
is, is valuable. So this is what they require. And in order to secure them, um, we don't collect answers from the landlords in a form or something. We are sending out our professional auditors based on an accreditation system. Like Colliers is our partner. They are working with us. They delegated the uh, uh, real estate professionals um, to carry out this audit. We teach them what they take care of it. Our, our uh, software helps a lot. Um, it is really a, a good tool to not to miss anything. And, um, and actually, yes, uh, so one crucial point that um, we are auditing the validity of all this data which lends to the, uh, to the users. Tafik, it sounds like this is the kind of uh, thing where ideally you would be speaking with developers before they uh, start construction to make sure their plans are... Uh, are, are sort of up, up to speed. Is that is that pra is that practical at this point? Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, the Czech Republic and the Prague market is quite specific because we have a relatively dry pipeline, so there are not many projects really coming. But ideally, in an ideal world, definitely yes, it's much easier to look into these things when they are still on paper mm -hmm. before they are being constructed and built. So this is the ideal scenario. Nevertheless, if you look at the Prox uh, existing stock uh, office space, the majority of that stock is 10 years plus in terms of age. So it means actually uh, it's relevant to all the existing stock regardless because all these properties, even if they have thought about how to improve the accessibility for people with special needs, uh, I'm sure things have changed or uh, new things can be introduced or they have been not uh, Im implemented at all to begin with. So I think this is equally relevant and applicable for any standing building, regardless of its uh, category standard A, B, even C, because, uh, well, there might be an obstacle again because how to enter into the reception and into the floor uh, but assuming that you have a reception area, you have an elevator, and so everything else is actually manageable and can be dealt with. In the whole ESG uh, question, which has been becoming increasingly important for the entire real estate community, I think there's there's always been a bigger focus on the environment uh, aspect of it. But this, to me, seems like it fits in quite naturally to the S part of ESG. Definitely. It's about the social. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't see that as much as the environment. Uh, it's more really uh, the social aspect of it and the well-being, uh, which is also part of that wider initiative. Okay. Um, uh, Robert, if I may join to the ESG yep. question, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Actually, we are, we are a bottom-up company, so basically our mission is uh, coming from that point that we wanted to solve this problem for the users, for the people with limitations, to so de deliver this information. But as we packed, um, finally it turned out that this ESG waves um, helps us a lot to penetrate. Why? Because we realized that actually in the S chapter, what to deliver to the social, it's really a challenge for the for those companies who are ESG reporting uh, obliged. And uh, it's really difficult uh, to make it measurable. This is one crucial point in ESG that uh, your performance should be measured and remeasured time to time or should be comparable to the industry in the same industry with other uh, players. Uh, and actually our, our system, uh, uh, what we saw is, um, is a real action you do something, you not only speak about that, what I will do when I will do something. So um, actually to, to make the audit is, is, um, is measuring the actual uh, status of the building in terms of inclusion or accessibility. Um, it, it's, a, it's a status report. It can be measured. So we, we are able to convert our data into scores, which is, as I mentioned, is important for them. And um, it, it has start and end. So you can count it that if I order um, this certification, it will be delivered in two, two months. And uh, I did something. And basically, our target group is the largest minor minority on earth. So uh, this is really something serious, important, and and um, and valuable. So it is not just to uh, not not uh, uh, how to say a, a misfunction or a, or a, um, a, a so just to do something. So this is this is. 
This is a real action. Okay, I think we'll start wrapping up. But first, I wanted to ask, how did you, how did this uh, initiative access for you get going? What was the what was the initial idea? Well, I don't understand this question. Really. What is the origin story for Access for You? How, why ah, were, why was okay. the company set up? <laughs> that that's my actually. Uh, once I speak, uh, you know that the, the stories are are um, remember always better the stories than so. I'm a, I'm a storyteller all around the world when I invited to speak. So basically, my my partner, the founder of the company, Bolage, is a wheelchair user. And um, as many of these, uh, I, I need to citate uh, another statistic here for the audience, which is very important, that 80% of the people suffering this kind of limitation are landing in this position between an age of 18 and 65. This is serious. That means that the majority of them, they know how was their life before, and they try, they want to live the same life, the, the same life long, I mean, uh, in the future. And and, uh, and they have their no sudden limitations and, and that, those challenges which uh, they never um, felt before. Um, so basically, Borash is a very vital and very so he's a, a tough guy, um, a businessman, and uh, with an age of 25, uh, the reason of, um, of an illness, he landed in wheelchair. But he tried to keep their life uh, going on, and he traveled. And even if he, if that he he had prepared uh, his his uh, trips um, concerning accessibility, he faced so many times barriers, misunderstandings, and um, and and uh, those kind of challenges. What he couldn't avoid in advance, or he he, he didn't see it in advance. So this was. Uh, um, and, and our story is the Lisbon story that he had a two weeks conversation with the, with the hotel owner and Rui told him that everything is fine. I have a very nice uh, handicapped room for you and so. And he landed with his friends at midnight in front of the hotel and he faced four huge stairs at the main entrance. And Rui told, don't, don't worry, this is the only problem here, but uh, my friend is here, we are helping you to get in with your chair. But Bolas told that, look, and you are here tomorrow every time when I want to go out and get in. And so, so this, this doesn't work. And that, that was actually the last drop for him. I need to deliver some solution for that. And um, as a businessman, he started to create a concept. And in a very early stage as a friend, we had a, a friendly lunch together about uh, private things. And he started to, to tell me his story. And I'm over 30 years entrepreneur with entrepreneurial um, thinking or mindset. So I immediately started to, let's say, to coach him or to, to evaluate the, 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 the story. But frankly saying it is based on a very long track record of personal experience. Why doesn't it work, actually? That's a very interesting topic. I would think knowing in advance is an incredibly important uh, issue for people. How do you think sh uh, companies should let that uh, should let potential visitors of uh, of the location know what what to expect ahead of time? Um, I'm not sure I'm, I'm understanding your question right, but uh, in other words, I mean, Balash who went to this hotel expecting everything would be fine, he couldn't know what he was going to what he yes. was going to be come come up against. I would think that a big issue about this is predictability, so that uh, so that people who have these types of uh, difficulties with buildings know ahead of time what they can uh, expect. Again, I think today, because that story goes back a couple of decades, uh, I think things have definitely changed and improved. Uh, but my point is that uh, I think the majority of people still in their mind, <clears throat> when they talk about disabilities, they see people in wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. And again, as we described, there are, there are far more uh, other uh, people who fall into that category with different types of disabilities. Hearing, seeing, uh, uh, even even women with prams, uh, with small sure. babies, when they need to have access into a space and so on. So uh, what is important is, again, to make sure that uh, all these aspects, and they can be easily highlighted, are simply explain it and again in our world we work with icons 
you have icons uh, for, for almost everything. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure even within, within, within our industry and related to people's disabilities, you will be easily be able to demonstrate how friendly the building is with very few simple icons with braille letters so you people who, who cannot see can easily read or navigate themselves with modern technologies and it where things again your your phones can speak to you identify areas so i believe the the mix uh, between today's technologies with having an open mind and having the the ideas of what i want to have to make it as accessible as possible mm -hmm. And, 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 and fuse as uh, a fusion of all that together, uh, that will become, uh, I would say, an, a new standard, a new norm, which we'll see in the near future. And, and maybe I will just add one thing because it's, it's a slogan I read in one of the fitness clubs, which I love. I, I, I'm more into health and healthy lifestyle, but I think it's equally valid for the business environment and offices. And the slogan actually states, my body or our bodies are not a decoration but a declaration of who we are and what we are and i think the same can be applied to the offices and buildings that the building and the space the interior of it it's not a decoration it's a declaration what i stand for what i want to achieve for whom i'm doing it and why Thomas, yeah, this is very nice Actually, uh, just to reflect on this last sentence, that uh, it's very interesting. Um, a client of us, a very good friend, and he has in Budapest uh, close to 10 restaurants and, and uh, uh, places for different events. And he told that, uh, you know, guys, uh, if, when I, um, I order this service, uh, let's make the audit. I want to, um, uh, how to state, uh, express all the details, even those ones which are not um, correct. So the uh, the miscompliance or the non-compliance uh, is also variable for the users. You catch perfectly this predictable that actually if I know that something is not good for me, I will not go there. But if I don't know, I will just stay there in front of that place and I can turn back. And this is pity. So it is much better to know that something is not good then uh, to hope that it will be good and then uh, to have a bad surprise. And actually, this guy thought that um, when, I, when I, um, I, I, I use your certificate, I, I, you make the audit, this, is, this will be not a message to the 16% of the related uh, people. This is a mes message to the other 84 as well, that uh, I'm like that. This is what Tefik thought, this is a declaration. So those companies who are dealing with this problem um, are identifying themselves as, um, as correct people delivering whatever the information is, because it can be good, it can be bad, but it makes sense. it's worth for the users to know that what will um, uh, host me there where you are. You understand, Robert? Yeah, I, I understand that. And does it mean that on someone's website that they can they can put a little icon? that people who know what they're looking for uh, will see it or not see it? Basically, our solution is a kind of listing, uh, but uh, today, as okay. long as the database is not big enough, right. uh, people are not uh, searching places through us, but which, which is the future. So once uh, it will be filled up with uh, thousands of buildings everywhere uh, on Earth, um, you can use it as a listing app. Uh, that I'm sitting in a main... Um, I'm here in, in a city, I, I'm a wheelchair user and I have headache and where is the pharmacy uh, nearby, the, the closest pharmacy when I can get in with my wheelchair to buy an Advil Ultra. Uh, that, that will be the future. But today, it's, um, the communication is rather vice versa. So th those companies, like for example, Media Markt in Hungary, uh, they are a very good example that uh, they put um, our link um, on the website, on the main website, and they say that if you are um, uh, someone with different kind of limitation, if you are interested for the accessibility features, they are linking their buyers, their users, their put so the, the, the consumers to our uh, website. Every place has his own property sheet with all the details. Everything is there, all the data, what we collected, the pictures, the measurements, mm -hmm. And uh, everyone can decide. So we have a kind of average or um, 
hard criteria and, and so our valuation is based on a kind of subjective um, limit what we what we draw here but everyone has different needs so the aim to deliver all the information detailed for them is the option for everyone to decide that okay you say that it is not enough not good for me but i'm a bit stronger i'm a bit more flexible it's still okay for me or i'm in a worse capacity and even if you say that it would be good for an average and I'm in a worse position, so I will not able to use it. But that's, that's the importance of delivering everything detailed and, and visible on our website and in a mobile application, what we um, prepared here in the, in the past years. Okay. okay, and finally, access for you. What is your plans for the future? Are you, you, you're spreading in, in Central Europe right now. Is Western Europe a huge growth market, or are all of these problems already taken care of a long time ago in Western Europe? No, absolutely, absolutely. So basically the problem is global. Uh, the lack of information is an average and the situation of uh, accessibility is also defying. So Bonash has a lot of uh, uh, pet stories also from Western Europe and actually there was a huge interest from United States and Canada. We started to, uh, uh, to build our uh, partnership uh, relationships there. We are auditing our first building in, in India Viper is a huge uh, um, software company um, and, and their first campus, uh, which will be now rebuilt or renovated, uh, will be based on our advice, actually. Um, so our intention is to, to be the global answer for that. Um, okay. And we are ambitious to, to be there and we are well prepared. So basically, um, um, all our steps are towards uh, that point that uh, that um, to solve these problems globally. Okay, and Taufik, uh, what is the nature of your cooperation then with Access for You? What what is your role and how does it work? So we we at Colliers we are in partnership with Access for You, and what we do is again we go and speak to all our clients, uh, and all of them are relevant. Uh, we educate them, we share the knowledge and information with them. We we have the discussions, and again, as you said, and as before, and I, I mentioned, the majority of, of our clients are into it and are already thinking of, of, of it. So we are just spreading, spreading the knowledge, and we try to offer the service where we can go, we can do the, the, the due diligence, we can do the checklist, the SWOT analysis, tell them exactly what needs to be done, uh, ideally if they can certify the buildings. Uh, and if you look at the monetary value, compared to the benefit and value add which you bring not only on a on a on a commercial business level but also again on a humane level and doing what is right uh, it's 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 peanuts it's really it's it's symbolic and i think it's a cost that everybody should not consider as a cost but as a thing which i, I must do uh, for many reasons uh, because we 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 Again, it's not purely about business. It's about trying to make our environment, our world, a better place to live in for everyone. Tomasz Taufik, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thanks.